You are listening to the Big Blue Marble Podcast with Anwar Knight. Oh, I could listen to that all day. Truly. It's a part of nature's symphony, a performance that millions of people are drawn to every day. The reassuring sounds of the grand ocean. You know, it has this power to ignite all of your senses in such a unique way. From the feeling of the wet sinking sand on your feet as you stroll along a beach. And then those ocean waves reaching out briefly. As if it's waltzing to its own music, connecting with you as the wave rolls in, draping along the shoreline before being pulled back to sea. It's really a grounding plate for the soul. But what makes the ocean so hypnotic and soothing? Well, according to scientists, it's a combination of things. Apparently, we are hardwired to respond to noises that come out of nowhere because they can mean something bad might happen. But sounds that are constant and soothing are considered non-threatening sounds to our brain. So the ebbing and flowing of the waves actually help destimulate our brains. And then it's coupled with the visuals of this expansive blue liquid that we know covers over 70% of our planet. And of course, there are the powerful crashing and cleansing waves. And as I discovered, it activates what is known as your parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for slowing us down and allowing us to relax and let our guard down. Even just staring at the ocean apparently changes our brainwave's frequency and puts us in a mild meditative state. Research studies have also shown that those who live near the water report less psychological distress. So why the hell are we destroying the oceans? Millions of tons of plastic enter the oceans each year. It's equivalent, get this, to dumping a garbage truck of plastic into an ocean every single minute. And it should be noted, by the way, although we typically refer to five oceans, the Arctic, Atlantic, Indian, Pacific, and Southern, in reality, it's one massive ocean. Just one. 1.3 billion cubic kilometers of water distributed into five basins. The ocean remains one of the most expansive, mysterious, and diverse places on Earth. And scientists say nearly 90% of the ocean floor remains unexplored. We haven't been there. So many natural water wonders that have yet to be discovered as they sit submerged like a buried treasure. What we do know is that our oceans are home to the greatest number of life forms on the planet. At last check, there were almost 230,000 different marine species that have been identified, with an estimated 2 million more multi-celled marine organisms still unknown. And while we boast about the seven natural land wonders of the world, which, don't get me wrong, they are impressive, but consider this. Mount Everest is known as the world's largest mountain, but only above sea level. Few know that Mauna Kea in Hawaii is in fact over a kilometer taller than Everest. It soars over 10,000 meters with its base actually anchored deep down in the Pacific Ocean. In the Atlantic, on the Arctic Circle between Iceland and Greenland, you'll find the Denmark Strait. What is that? Well, it's the world's highest underwater waterfall. We're talking a rush of cascading water falling over 3,500 meters. Guys, Niagara Falls is 53 meters high. So the Denmark Strait is 70, that's 70, 70 times higher than Niagara Falls. And all of this, all of this happens underwater. So I ask you again, why the hell are we destroying the oceans? Hello, my friends. My name is Anwar Knight, your host. Thank you for joining us here on the Big Blue Marble Podcast. And thank you for taking me along with you wherever you may be. I appreciate your time and your company. Today, we dive deep into polluted waters and find out about the state of our oceans, the importance of them, and take a guess, what do you think is the most common ocean litter? 
You'll be surprised, and we'll find out. It's straight ahead right here on the Big Blue Marble Podcast. Have a question, comment, or show idea? Let us know at BigBlueMarble.org. And a warm welcome to George Leonard, who is joining us from Santa Cruz, California today. He is the chief scientist from the Ocean Conservancy Organization. They have a dedicated team that works hard to protect the oceans on many fronts. It's great to have your insight today, George. Uh, It's great to be here, Anwar. I appreciate it. Now, your passion is certainly clear, as I read in your bio. Of all things you could be in the world, you chose the Sunflower Sea Star. (laughs) <laughs> I was so intrigued, I had to Google it. Wow, it is a beautiful creature. It is. Uh, Pycnopodia helianthoides, if you can say that 10 times fast. I came to California. Uh, I'm on the West Coast here in California. I came here from the East Coast of the United States uh, to study marine biology back in 1990. And when I first got in the California kelp forest, I came across these ginormous uh, sea stars, which would literally romp across the bottom. Uh, You could see them kind of galloping across the rocks, and uh, I was just enthralled. And so I've always thought it would be cool to come back and be a Pycnopodia. Yeah, the ocean is full of cool creatures. It's really quite incredible, actually, just how vast the underwater sea world is. And for most of us, uh, out of one's reach, really. Never getting a chance to witness the beauty deep down, but maybe, maybe that's a good thing to leave it intact, because our oceans are literally our planet's life support system, right? I don't think it is an exaggeration. It's a great talking point, but it is very much true. Uh, You know, the reason we have life on the planet is because we have water on this planet. Uh, And the ocean, uh, you know, controls our weather. Uh, It controls the climate. Uh, It controls the hydrological cycle. So it determines, essentially, it creates the the rain uh, that falls on the land that, of course, we're dependent on. Um, It produces about half of the oxygen that we breathe uh, from the microscopic plants called phytoplankton uh, that live at the surface of the ocean where there is sunlight. Uh, About about a billion people on the planet uh, get their uh, primary source of protein from the ocean. Uh, And the global ocean economy is uh, calculated in the trillions of dollars. Yes, the, the contribution just in the fishing industry alone is staggering. And we'll get into that in a moment. But what I find so amazing is that despite the significant advances in science and technology, our oceans are still very much a deep, dark mystery. Well, well, that is totally true. Um, you know, the ocean, as, as everybody knows, covers 70 percent of the planet, but it makes up something like 99 percent of the of the habitats, the living habitats. Uh, on uh, on the planet, and and most of that is well out of our reach. Um, scuba divers can get down to about 120 feet or so, uh, but the ocean goes down on average, you know, 4,000 kilometers. Um, so the ocean is is a, a very large place. We we know uh, a fair amount about it, uh, and we are growing in our knowledge every day. But uh, it is still true that you know we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the deep sea. And I suspect that might be in part why there is this misconception between the fact that there is so much still to explore and learn alongside the fact that the ocean is just so big. We take it for granted that it'll always be there, this thriving entity, if you will, on our Earth. That's right. For a long time, we thought it was, uh, you know, that we really couldn't damage it. Um, In the 1600s, when, uh, you know, when there were, when fisheries were were very new, um, there was a sense that you couldn't possibly overfish the oceans. Uh, and then in the 1970s, after uh, after the Second World War, where fisheries really took off, um, it became pretty clear that you could, in fact, overfish uh, overfish the the oceans. Um, if you look at the plastics crisis, one of the big threats to the oceans now is the flow of plastic into the ocean. And something like 8 million metric tons of plastic are flowing into the ocean every year. Um, and there was kind of this sense that, you know, dilution is the solution. If it flows to the ocean, it'll, um, it won't become a problem. And yet we know that, that plastics are now accumulating everywhere um, in the ocean. And, and the other really big one here is carbon dioxide. So uh, as you alluded to at the top of the hour, the biggest long-term existential threat to the oceans is climate change. And that's because of carbon dioxide. Um, and that is dissolving in the ocean. And when I was in graduate school uh, as a PhD student studying uh, basic uh, biochemistry of the oceans, uh, there's a series of complicated 
chemical equations whose conclusion was that the, the ocean is a great buffering system uh, and that, uh, that everything is essentially in equilibrium at the largest of scales. And what's really been discovered, and it's rather terrifying in the last uh, 30 years or so, is that, is that carbon dioxide is now flowing into the ocean at such a level uh, that it is actually um, throwing off this ability of the ocean uh, to, to buff to, for the chemistry to be buffered. And we are slowly but inexorably changing the chemistry of the ocean in a way that I think, I think folks never thought was going to be an issue. Well, let me ask you this then. I'm curious. Do you think we are polluting our oceans more today than ever before? Or are we, in fact, discovering and have the science now to analyze and actually recognize the full extent of the damage that has been done? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, our, our, our knowledge base continues to grow. And so as, as we grow our knowledge base, what we are discovering for almost all of these threats is that the threats are bigger and faster and stronger than we thought they were. So as we collect new information, this is particularly the case in climate change, it's not like new studies are coming in saying, oh, we overestimated this problem. It's actually smaller than we thought. Almost every study says, oops, it turns out that the impacts are larger than we, than we thought beforehand. Um, and, and that's because, again, the, the pace of these changes is growing. If you look at, at plastics, for an example, where the, uh, about 8 to 10 million tons are flowing in every year, there are estimates that that those numbers will go up essentially exponentially over the next uh, 20 uh, to 30 years unless, unless things change. Uh, the same is true for, uh, for carbon and heat in the ocean. So the, the rate of uptake uh, itself is accelerating. So these, these problems are, uh, are, are not just bad, but, but in fact the pace and the scale of them are, are accelerating and our science and our instruments and our technology is allowing us to better, under, better understand that. So where are we at? Uh, how would you describe the state of our oceans today then? Well, I would, I would say it's poor and probably getting worse. Um, it's a little terrifying. Um, I remain optimistic because I think we have more eyes and more instruments and more political leaders and more business leaders paying attention to this now. But it's difficult not to, uh, you know, not to recognize the pace and the scale of the change that's happening. If you look at coral reefs, for example, um, you know, coral reefs are uh, some of the most biodiverse areas uh, in the world's oceans. Uh, for those who have snorkeled or, or scuba dive on them, they are, you know, just incredibly lush vibrant places, uh, but they are uh, really being impacted by climate change now. So heat waves are causing corals to bleach, uh, which is a natural feature. So corals have done this for millennia, uh, but the problem is the water is now getting hot and the heat waves under the water, which are similar to heat waves that we experience on land, are, are getting stronger uh, and closer and closer together. So corals are having a hard time recovering um, from these marine heat waves. And, and the predictions for the future of corals are pretty dire. Um, if we don't get ourselves off of, uh, off of a, a high emissions trajectory from a, from a climate change perspective in terms of how much CO2 is being released into the air, um, essentially 99% of the corals are going to be, uh, be extinct by 2100. If we can manage to get ourselves off of, uh, off of carbon and on a low trajectory uh, future, um, about 90% of the corals are still going to be lost. Now that leaves 10% that we could reseed the ocean with and that could potentially, uh, you know, turn things around. Uh, but either way, 90% or 99% are very big numbers um, and, are, and are really sort of terrifying numbers for marine biologists to consider. Wow, that floors me. I had no idea the future for coral was so ominous. I, I'm quite familiar in the, in the importance and the role that they play. Uh, even as something as, as simple as providing a crucial barrier that protects uh, the coastlines of more than 100 countries, and of course, most importantly, the diversity of ecosystems, as you mentioned. But this is pretty scary. Well, yes, and, and coral reefs, of course, which uh, only only exist, uh, the warm water coral reefs really around the tropics, um, are, are really important in the equatorial parts of the world um, for local communities. So a lot of the you know, these are not just sort of playgrounds for, for tourists to enjoy. Um, they provide uh, lots of, 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 uh, of protein, of uh, fish, for lots of local indigenous communities. And so if we lose those coral reefs, 
or if those fish, because the water is hot, um, begin to move away from the poles and move or from the equator and move toward the poles, which is what's already happening, or move into deep water, um, we're just going to have fewer and fewer fish there. It's going to create a, a food crisis in, in many parts of that world. Yeah, and I, I don't think many realize, especially when you live in a, in a landlocked environment, just how many people rely on the sea for a primary food source. It is the largest traded food commodity in the world, that being fish. But I want to backtrack for a moment, if I could. You mentioned about ocean heat waves. So is that because the ocean retains 90% of the heat energy from global warming, so it's essentially like boiling a, a pot on a stove? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the physics difference here is a thing called latent heat of fusion. And if you, and if you think back to your basic physics and chemistry classes, um, there's, there's gases and then there's liquids. And a, and a liquid, uh, typically like water, can hold a whole lot more heat energy um, than, than a gas can. And, you know, most of, most of the heating of the globe is actually happening in the water. Um, so 90% of that heat has been absorbed by, uh, by the ocean. And yet, right, and yet look at what's happening in Australia um, just this week where, you know, massive wildfires are being driven by uh, temperatures that they have experienced in the interior of Australia in, you know, 120 degrees. These are temperatures that have really, uh, you know, broken historical records and are driving massive change on land. Um, and so I think most of us are, are obviously you know, uh, deeply troubled by what's happening in Australia and what's happening on land. Um, but it's important to recognize that these kinds of wildfires are actually, um, you know, cascading through the ocean as well. Yeah, that's an interesting analogy. I really wanted to ask you about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. For the most part, it has been put into the spotlight because of media reports. I mean, listen, the vast majority of, of the human population on Earth will never see it in person. And this thing's huge. Some estimate that it spans over 1.6 million square kilometers. But it's important to note here, despite the perception of it being literally a floating island of trash that you could say walk on, it's actually a soupy mass of clustered garbage. Would that be accurate? Well, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, it's a pretty captivating term, right? The Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, it has generated, uh, frankly, a lot of attention on this problem of plastics in the ocean. Um, but it is very much not a floating island of trash. If it was, in fact, a floating island of trash, we could probably go out there and clean it up. Uh, but the problem is it is lots and lots of flex. It's almost like confetti. Um, you know, pieces of plastic about the size of the small fingernail uh, on one of your on one of your hand uh, one of your fingers um, that are distributed. Uh, it, they are concentrated, in fact, in the middle of these gyres, these great gyres of which we have five of them in the world's oceans. Uh, but they're still, you know, relatively diffuse. Um, the concentration of plastic particles at its highest is, you know, upwards of about one per meter squared of water. Um, so there's still a lot more water than there is plastics. Uh, but if you add up all those numbers, they're, they're pretty terrifying in the sense that there's, um, you know, trillions of these flecks of plastics um, out in the world's oceans. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is, in fact, the biggest of the five, uh, and it was discovered by Charles Moore in the 90s when he sailed through it. Um, and there's been a lot of work uh, in, in all of the, uh, the, the patches to uh, essentially use uh, nets, nets that are designed to catch zooplankton and phytoplankton, these very small creatures that live in the ocean, um, the plastic is about the size of that marine life. And so if you tow those behind your boat, um, you can collect, uh, the, collect the microplastics as well. So is it primarily microplastics then? You know, I was reading one report suggesting uh, also fishing gear and old nets, etc. Could you give us an idea what makes up this great Pacific garbage bag? Yeah, so it turns out that you know, you can pretty much find everything, including the kitchen sink in the world's oceans. Um, at Ocean Conservancy, we have for uh, well over 35 years now hosted the International Coastal Cleanup, which happens on the third Saturday uh, in September every year. And it's become the biggest volunteer effort on behalf of the world's oceans last year. A million people turned out and collected almost 20 million pounds of marine debris um, from the world's um, beaches and, and waterways. And 
you know, the, the tail of that distribution, uh, the, the diversity of things that are found out the, there, the weird finds, everything from handguns to kitchen sinks to mattresses, um, you know, all, all these kinds of materials can be, can be found in, in the world's oceans. Out in the open ocean, in the middle of these gyres, um, if you sail out there in a boat, for you know most of the time you're out there, the ocean looks blue and clean and clear. Um, although all around you are these microplastics that you, if you if you strain them out of the water, you can see them both with a naked eye and with uh, with a microscope. Uh, but there are also uh, items, uh, particularly plastic items, that have persisted that are less abundant but are larger, and the, and the biggest con contributor to that uh, is lost fishing gear. Um, these are things like nets and ropes and lines and buoys um, that have either been intentionally discarded or unintentionally lost at sea. Um, and then uh, just like the microplastics get caught up in the gyre and, and concentrate out there. And I think the study you're referring to um, showed that it, by total mass, not individual number now, but by total mass, about half of the plastics that's out in the gyre may in fact be um, from fishing gear itself. So I think it's a, a somewhat untold story about plastics in the ocean because we know that fishing gear um, is the most deadly form of plastic in the ocean because in fact it's made up of nets which are designed to catch fish and, and therefore can unintentionally collect, uh, you know, catch other marine, marine mammals. But this isn't just about uh, plastic straws and cups, although it is very much about those items. It is also about uh, fishing gear as well. How sad is that? Tens of thousands of tons of garbage and plastic-based crap just spinning around these gyres. And when it comes to microplastic pieces, by the way, for our listeners who may be new to the Big Blue Marble podcast, we have highlighted them before, but these are plastic fragments that are less than five millimeters or half a centimeter in size and even smaller. In many cases, very much smaller than that. Yes, right. And of course, the larger pieces are easy to identify, but... George, it's those very tiny ones, the pieces that you can't see, that potentially can do the most harm. You know, what, what's interesting about plastics in the ocean is, as I mentioned, um, uh, about 8 million metric tons at least is flowing into the ocean. This was an estimate from a group of scientists that we brought together a number of years ago who made this calculation and published this paper, which in 2015 really, um, really got a lot of attention both from uh, the public but also the plastics industry. Um, but interestingly, if you go out and add up the total amount of plastic that you can find, for example, floating at the surface of the gyre, um, that number is only about 3% of this amount that scientists think is actually flowing into the ocean. So the question is, where is the missing plastic? And this has been an issue for the last couple of decades. It really has not been answered. And so we don't really know where all this plastics go, but we are worried um, that it's ending up, uh, well, we know it's ending up in fish uh, and other marine life. Uh, we don't really know um, the magnitude of that. And of course, humans are at the top of the food web and, and we're eating this. And so there is growing worry that we are consuming plastic through the seafood. But the way this works is once the fragments, because plastic will break into smaller and smaller pieces, once those fragments get small enough, they can then be ingested by small animals at the base of the food web. And these are things, um, I refer to them as, as, as uh, uh, zooplankton. So these are little animals that filter feed from the water. And they're typically filter feeding little microscopic algae, plants. Uh, and the microplastics can be about the size of the food that they will normally eat. And so they will take them up into their guts um, and, uh, and then, th then larger, you know, then small fish can eat the little, uh, fi the zooplankton, then larger fish. Uh, can eat the smaller fish, and then the next thing you know, they're being eaten by um, tunas and uh, and marine mammals and other and other larger animals, including seabirds. So there is definitely a, a way to kind of bioaccumulate these in the food web. Um, there is no present uh, kind of smoking gun, if you will, uh, that we are poisoning uh, people uh, through this process. But I would say that the scientific community and the toxicological community is doing a lot of research on this. Uh, because they're they're really worried about it, uh, and we need to get a better handle uh, on the concentrations and the scale and the scope of the potential contamination that's going going on. Mm -hmm. Any idea on how we can do that? Well, I mean, so there's there's a couple of things that we need to do. We we need much better samples across 
uh, all the different kinds of marine life that are being impacted by plastics. The rule of thumb now is about, if you look at the limited studies that are out there, about 30% of the fish by number and about 35% um, by species count um, uh, have plastic in their, in their stomachs when they're caught. Um, and, uh, and we know that the contaminants on plastics, can, uh, plastics have a way of like a sponge sucking up uh, contaminants out of the marine environment and, and then delivering those to the fish. So we know that those contaminants can be delivered to the fish because um, we have worked out that sort of brick in the wall. Um, we don't know, there's a few studies that suggest that they can impact that, that plastic uptake can impact the physiology of the fish. Uh, in one case, there was some preliminary evidence that it might, might have caused a uh, tumor within the liver of the fish. Um, and so all those things are worrying, but we, we really don't know, um, you know, kind of how broad scale that is. Uh, and in particular, that missing link between the fish themselves and human consumption is still um, really poorly explored. Yeah, and it really needs to be pushed forward. One report I was reading highlighting some of the, the locations where, where contaminated fish and shellfish have been found, from Europe, Brazil, to the coast of mainland China, and even here in Canada. So we need to eliminate the plastic on a wide scale, no question about it. And, and several years ago, a young entrepreneur, Boyan Slat, founded the ocean cleanup effort to create a system that can help clean the oceans, and eventually this so-called patch, and I'm sure, George, you and your team are aware of this initiative. Yes, we are. But I bring it up because it's only in the last six months that his team have actually achieved some success in developing a large-scale apparatus that is actually working. It has taken years, and I think it shows just how difficult it is to actually tackle ocean pollution. Well, that's right. I mean, it, it, this is a vexing problem. I will say that um, if you're trying to develop a solution to plastics in the ocean, the place that actually seek that solution out is not in the ocean, it's on land. Um, at Ocean Conservancy, we have long advocated that you need to solve this problem on land. You've got to stem the flow of plastics long before it gets to the ocean. Um, and I think, I think the ocean cleanup in Buoyant Slat is, is kind of learning that lesson. Um, there are a number of scientific uh, experts, uh, including ourselves, were, were quite critical um, uh, of the ocean cleanup because, because um, you know, the, the, the plastic is so diffuse in the o open ocean, uh, you know, it's, it's like, it's like vacu vacuum, vacuuming sand out of the Saharan. Uh, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not going to be an effective approach. And so you need to go where the plastic is concentrated and where it's concentrated is, is largely in rivers. Um, and, and the ocean cleanup is actually, I think you may be referring to this new device that they're developing to put into rivers, which is in fact where we think, where we think the interventions uh, can be strongest. The other concern that the marine science community has, and this includes us here at Ocean Conservancy, is um, because, as we've been discussing, many of the plastics are the size of the animals themselves in the ocean, um, we don't see any way that you can sort of sieve out the plastics uh, without sieving out um, marine life as well. Um, and, and some of the preliminary data that the ocean cleanup pushed out uh, about uh, three or four months ago uh, seem to show a fair amount of plastic, but it also, uh, some scientists pointed out that it, that it included a lot of marine life uh, as well, uh, including Valella Valella, which are these little by-the-wind sailors that are blue, um, which suggested that um, to get the plastic, you were also going to kill a lot of marine life. So the real solution to this, I think from a cost perspective, but also an effectiveness perspective, is to, is to move closer to where the plastic is coming from, and that's on land, and, and ultimately that connection between land and the sea. You mentioned rivers, so are you saying that the bulk of the microplastics are finding their way to the oceans actually through rivers and streams? Well, yes. I mean, so, so there's, there's about 20, the scientists estimate that about 20% of the plastic in the ocean is coming from marine industry. So for example, the fishing industry, right? So there's no real direct connection to land in for about 20%. The rest, the other 80% is coming from land. And, and that can come from beaches, uh, uh, but it can also uh, come down waterways and watersheds, and of course rivers are the ma major conduit for that. The ocean cleanup uh, has, has, has basically built a device that's quite similar, uh, for example, to the Baltimore trash wheel, which is a really creative uh, and kind of fun approach that's being used in, in Baltimore. 
um, to intercept the plastic as it just flows naturally down down the river. And so it's a ve it's a passive collection device. Um, we at Ocean Conservancy are working um, uh, in Southeast Asia right now on a on a on a similar kind of a, approach uh, to test the efficacy of these kinds of interventions that you can do in rivers. Um, because yeah, we very much believe that um, that that's how you can kind of grab the plastic before it goes in the ocean. But, but there are steps before that, right? So ideally, what we want to do is we want to reduce our use of plastics uh, to the extent that we can. And then we want to make sure that those materials um, don't escape into the environment uh, on land and then find their way into streams and rivers, right? So what we really need, and this is particularly the case in a lot of developing countries, I think in the, in the United States and Canada, we uh, we sort of take for granted that the truck comes down the street once a once a week, and we put our materials in our in our bin, and off it goes. You know, for a, a lot of developing countries, they don't have the kind of basic waste management infrastructure that we've come uh, to take for granted, and so we need really massive investments in some of this foundational, uh, very simplistic approaches to handle the marine debris, to handle the waste that we have, um, while we simultaneously try to reduce the generation of plastic waste, um, and then simultaneously uh, for materials that do escape uh, the, our best efforts, uh, make sure that we get them before they go into the ocean at all. And kudos to your team at the Ocean Conservancy. You inspire literally thousands of people to group together, as you mentioned, with your annual ocean cleanup. And you reveal a list of the top 10 items collected. I wanted to highlight and share the top five because it really surprised me in fifth spot was straws, four was plastic bottle caps, three were food wrappers, two were plastic bottles, but the number one garbage item collected during ocean cleanups were cigarette butts. Yes, and, and cigarette butts have always been at the top of the list. Um, and, you know, this top 10 list varies a little bit year by year, um, but cigarette butts um, have always been sort of the most abundant. Um, they are, they're pretty different. They are made of plastic, um, like, like the other items uh, in the top 10 list, but, but they are, are quite different than consumer products, right? They, they are from a certain community that smokes. There's a, there's a high incidence of, of littering of cigarette butts, uh, and they are particularly toxic to marine life because of, uh, of the various chemicals that are captured in, in, in the filter. Um, they really require, uh, you know, for, for a lot of these items, um, they require specific and different kinds of solutions. Um, so, uh, you know, cigarette butts are going to require um, the cigarette industry to think uh, differently about how, uh, how their, their consumers dispose of those particular products. But, you know, you had the list of five, right, which was straws, bottle caps, food wrappers, plastic bottles, and cigarette butts. It, it continues down to 10. And for the first time last year, every item in the top 10 was made of plastics. So a lot of people have asked, like, is this problem of marine debris and, and waste in the ocean, is it really about plastic? And it really is, um, because the you know, consumption and production and use of plastic is, is escalating, uh, both in terms of volume, but also in terms of different kinds of products. Um, so, you know, that was a bit of a milestone that the top 10 list is, is made entirely of plastic. But I'm wondering here that maybe the bigger focus should be on banning cigarette butts over, say, something like straws. Sure, in a perfect world, both. But my point is, I don't recall any media stories, any call to action from the public or officials to ban cigarette butts. Straws garnered significant media attention, but the most littered item in our oceans appears to be cigarette butts. Yeah, well, I think in some respects it depends a little bit on, on where you live. So I'm here in California, um, and our Ocean Conservancy offices are in Santa Cruz in Central California, and our Assembly member, Mark Stone, um, has been a real advocate for this, and he has introduced in the last couple of California legislative sessions uh, a bill that would basically ban cigarette butts. Um, you wouldn't ban cigarettes, but you would ban these plastic artificial cigarette filters um, because, in fact, they have no health benefits, uh, which most people don't understand. Um, and then, of course, all they do is contaminate the environment. So those bills um, have yet to pass the legislature. Um, there's obviously a lot of pushback um, from the industry on that, but he has he had has advanced a kind of a, a solution to that. The other thing that's happened here in California uh, is our governor uh, finally uh, signed 
legislation at the state level that bans smoking on on beaches on state beaches here in California um, and so there is a you know there is a concerted effort here um, to try try to address that issue but you know you 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 sort of you know pit straws against cigarette butts we think we think that um, it's a mistake to only focus on one of these items we need to think about all of them we need to think about our individual choices whether it's with your cigarette butt or uh, you know, avoiding straws if you don't need them. Um, but at the same time, for many of our environmental problems, whether it's climate change uh, or plastics, uh, it, these are not going to be solved on the back of individual consumers and individual decisions alone. We need systemic change. We need uh, the private sector, in the case of the plastics industry, to really step up and drive solutions at a scale that will make a quantitative difference for the ocean and of course in the case of climate change right uh, we are not going to stem climate change uh, by changing our light bulbs alone we need a fundamental rethink um, about how we use energy and the role of renewable energy in our, in our future and um, um, you know individual choices are really important and they empower people because they give them a a sense that they are doing something and they can have impact in their own sort of net, you know small orbit um, but it's important uh, to recognize that we need to channel that energy ultimately um, you know to voting for people who uh, want to support environmental um, or solutions to these kinds of systemic environmental problems so how do we help what can I what can our listeners do to help our oceans well I think there's there's a number of things and I and I alluded to um, the voting piece but I think you know, at the top of the list, uh, and in Ocean Conservancy, we are a nonpartisan organization, but what we are partisan about is uh, science, and we think that science and scientific facts and data are our critical prerequisites to, um, you know, smart public policy. And so I would say, you know, individuals need to vote for elected officials who um, support science, who respect science, um, and um, are willing to act um, in terms of public policy and decision making uh, informed by that science. And you can be on any side of the political spectrum, um, but that, that, that's a critical piece. Um, but there's a number of other things. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're taking too many fish out of the ocean, so buying sustainable seafood uh, is, a, is a really um, powerful way that you can send a market signal into the fishing industry saying we want, we want to buy uh, we really only want to buy seafood that comes from healthy, abundant stocks that have minimum impact on the environment. Um, we've talked a lot today about minimizing your plastic footprint, uh, turning out every September uh, for the International Coastal Cleanup and being a member of uh, a million strong people around the world. Um, cleaning up uh, beaches, your local beach as part of a global effort, I think is a really empowerful, uh, empowering and an emotional experience for a lot of people. Um, reducing your individual carbon footprint, whether it's, you know, riding a bike or walking or, or buying a fuel efficient vehicle. These are all activities um, that actually have, have a big impact on the ocean um, because, because carbon and climate change is, is so important. Um, but, you know, other things, sitting around, and we've just come off of the holidays, but sitting around the uh, table for Thanksgiving or Christmas and, and talking to your friends and relatives about the importance of oceans, um, we need a much broader and deeper conversation with people about how important oceans are. Um, and then of course, just learning more about what's happening in the ocean um, is, uh, is something that all of us can do. And you, you know, you can visit uh, our website, oceanconservancy.org. We have a lot of information up there, uh, but of course we all have access to Google. Uh, and if you type in a few keywords, you can uh, really learn a tremendous amount about what's happening in the ocean. Uh, whether it's your local backyard or or the deep sea, uh, you know, thousands of miles from the coast. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to do a show on this. It's really important. Again, when is your international coastal cleanup running this year? It's always the third Saturday in September. And as we wrap up, you mentioned earlier that you remain optimistic. You still have hope for the world's oceans. I do. I, I think in part because if you work in ocean conservation as, as I do and all of us here at Ocean Conservancy, you know, we're, we're in the business of hope. Uh, that's that's why we're doing this. Uh, if we didn't think there was any solutions to this, we'd uh, you know we'd get out of this uh, out of this line of work. And and you know when I walk the halls here and talk to my colleagues, um, even in the face of some of these changes, 
the, the optimism that, that we all have is, is really palpable. We now you know, have a huge body of evidence that say, if you protect the ocean, if you give it a chance, um, Mother Nature is incredibly resilient and it can come back from some of these threats. Um, so if we protect more of the ocean and if we make a concerted global effort uh, to get off of uh, fossil fuels, I do think that the ocean has a future and a, and a healthy future at that. Well, let's hope so. I have learned so much today, George. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Big Blue Marble podcast. I hope we can do this again. Absolutely. It's been a real pleasure. I'm I got, glad I got a chance to talk to you and your listeners today. George Leonard was my guest today. He's the chief scientist with the Ocean Conservancy. For more information of their efforts to help the world's oceans, Log online, oceanconservancy.org. Time now to buckle up and travel the world as we highlight some of the other eco-stories happening on our planet with this edition of The Blue Files. A devastating and mysterious seabird die-off may now have some answers. Researchers believe a vast swath of warm ocean water in the Northeast Pacific Ocean, dubbed the Blob, caused the largest mass death of ocean-dwelling birds in recorded history. Close to one million birds, most of them the common muir, a fish-eating species, starved to death between the summer of 2015 and spring 2016. The unprecedented marine heat wave of nutrient-poor water emerged off the Pacific coast of the United States. The blob was up to six degrees Celsius above normal and extended more than 3,000 kilometers along the coastline to Alaska. The extreme warm-up wreaked havoc on the region's marine ecosystems and caused an enormous drop in the production of microscopic algae that feed a range of animals while also nurturing a massive bloom of harmful algae that killed off many animals and cost fisheries millions of dollars in lost income. Talk about bloomin' chance. Some conservationists believe they accidentally discovered the world's largest and smelliest flower bloom. Scientists were exploring a remote jungle in Indonesia's West Sumatra where they discovered a type of corpse flower. The massive blossom measures 3.6 feet in diameter, which is over one meter wide or roughly the width of a dining table. The flower has flesh-colored petals covered in white blister-like spots and comes complete with a signature scent, that of a rotting carcass. These rare plants are also parasitic, meaning they grow inside the root of a host plant. The corpse flower propagates for around nine months until suddenly revealing itself to the world with a gigantic stinking bloom. I've posted a picture of this odd and fascinating plant species on our website under the Blue Files link as featured in episode 9 at BigBlueMarvel.Earth. A secret CIA surveillance mission reveals that the glaciers around Mount Everest have lost much more ice than previously thought. The mission, which ended in 1972, was steered by U.S. intelligence officials with the objective of spying on the Soviet Union using satellite imagery. By the time these images were declassified in 1995, the mission had amassed more than 800,000 photos. The pictures offer a rare glimpse of the Himalayas that researchers combined with recent satellite views to piece together the difference of the ice-covered mountains. The Rongbek and Kumbu glaciers, where Everest base camps are located, have thinned by more than 260 feet, or 80 meters, over 60 years. And not surprisingly, they've also found that ice loss dramatically accelerated in the 1980s. Yet again, more compelling evidence of our warming planet. And that's this edition of The Blue Files. As we wrap up, a couple of program notes. We'll be heading to Australia on our next episode and get the latest on what some are calling the animal apocalypse. Just an unbelievable tragedy in Australia with the record bushfires and an estimated one billion animals that have been killed. Plus, did you know that air pollution is cutting on average our lifespan by almost two years, making it the world's top killer? We're going to find out what you can do to protect yourself. Those are just a few of the episodes that are upcoming here on the Big Blue Marble Podcast. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Anwar Knight, A-N-W-A-R, Knight with a K, for show updates. And if you can, please retweet and share the posts. I really do appreciate it. 
and we'll be sure to send out a shout out to you on a future show when you do that sign up for our newsletter too another edition coming very soon you can do that on our website at bigbluemarble.earth and be sure to subscribe to the podcast that ensures that you'll find out first when our new episodes are available i want to say a big thank you to sandy who listens in from the cayman islands so great to have your company sandy and i appreciate you sharing the show that's how we can really make a difference here sharing the podcast we can all learn and discover together how to be a part of the change that needs to happen that's all for now my friends i'm anwar knight wishing you a great day on the big blue marble hey dad that was an awesome show